Welcome in. It is the Football Guys DFS show. It is the best worst week of the year, the most thankful week of the year. It is Thanksgiving week. It is week 13. We are here for your DFS slates, both on on DraftKings primarily, on FanDuel as well, hitting GPPs and hitting cash games. And joined, as always, is our DFS captain, Devin Knotts, and our good friend, Phil Alexander. And, and gentlemen, happy Thanksgiving. And, and Devin, how are you doing tonight? I am doing excellent, Jeff. We'll leave it at that. Not bu- nope. not busy, not busy at all this week. Not busy at all. Anyway, we, we made a joke prior to the show that we we feel like we have to do twice as much work and half the amount of time here this week. But we do love football and we do love this week and we are so thankful for everybody and especially you out there, the listeners. But Phil, how are you doing tonight? Doing just ducky. Uh, looking forward Storm to duck. starting tomorrow. Yeah. Corner. Looking forward to a, um, a another successful week. Last week was a, a good week, uh, I think, for the show and definitely for me personally. Um, this week's slate is also looking fun. It's a little bit weird. It's fairly short. There's ten games. Uh, I noticed that most of the 1 p.m. games are fairly gross with a couple of decent ones mixed in. Uh, but then at, at 4 p.m., uh, we, we should be looking at some good featured games. But um, it's, a, it's a fun slate because there's a lot of high-end running backs and wide receivers, so we got a lot of different ways that we could build. Um, in terms of games that we're targeting – um, I think that you have to start with those two games at four o'clock. That's Eagles at Ravens. Um, Eagles at Ravens has a 51 point over under Ravens favored by three uh, in what should be a, a fairly high scoring game. And then um, the one that I think that I like to shoot out the best has a 48 point over under that's Rams at Saints uh, Rams on the road as short favorites by a field goal. And, um, and then there are a couple of games at, at 1 p.m. We've got Chargers at Falcons that could see some points. We've got – what is up with the Steelers at Bengals? Um, the Bengals are like 3-8. and eight. The Steelers are like 8-3. and three. Don't quote me on those, but somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, yet the Bengals are three-point home favorites here in a game with a 47-point total, which took me by surprise. Um, so that that is at least an interesting game. That one – Smells a little funny, but we'll uh, we'll see what happens with that. And Steelers then just lost to the Browns. Yeah, I, I suppose they did just lose to the Browns, but that was like a wonky snow game. I mean, I don't know. I, I guess not cold that cold I'm like, day. yeah, not that I'm overly impressed with the the Steelers and and that I don't think the Bengals could beat them. It's just a weird spread to see uh, with two teams in the division with those records. So. Uh, th- those are the games that stood out to me. I don't know if you guys got any other ones. Bucks Panthers, I think, is interesting um, from what we've seen from the offense from the Bucks, and then kind of the revitalization or the reviving of uh, Bryce Young's career, really, and the way that they played the the Chiefs difficult or tough last week. Um, my body cer- certainly left my soul when uh, I. Sterling Shepard got an end zone target, bounced off his hands, and I was like, there it was. There it was, uh, the the end zone target that I needed for Sterling Shepard. But, uh, Devin, is there anything else you're watching this week? Nope. All right, let's 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 hit it here. Before we take a moment, before we go into our cash games, please take a moment to like and subscribe. Do all those great things. We thank you so much for being our listeners. We appreciate you being along every step of the way. Let's look at cash game plays. Devin, what are you looking at cash game quarterback? Yeah, it's Justin Herbert this week against Atlanta. I mean, his price just for whatever reason refuses to go up. Um, 5,600. Atlanta's pass defense, I mean, they've been okay. Nothing special. You know, if, if you could have middle of the road, that's they're actually a little bit worse than that. So they're allowing um, quarterbacks. They are allowing, yeah, they're, they're about in the middle there. I mean, they're, they've allowed the ninth most fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks this year. Depending on what site, what site or what scoring system you're using, it all varies a little bit. But I mean, they allowed 307 yards and four touchdowns to Bo Nix last week, and or in week 11, and 5600 for Justin Herbert with no J.K. Dobbins. I don't trust either Gus Edwards or Kamani Vidal. So let's let's get the passing side of this game. I think it's pretty simple this week. 
Phil, are you in the same place thinking Justin Herbert for your cash game lineups? Yeah, I scrolled down the list. I got to Justin Herbert at 5,600. I stopped scrolling and I clicked his name. Uh, like Devin said, it really is that easy this week. Um, in addition to to the, the passing numbers that you're going to get from Herbert, by the way, he's developed a nice little 30-yard rushing floor uh, where he's hit that number or close enough to it in four of his last five games. So you're getting good production on the on the ground, I think. It's safe to say at this point that that's like a planned part of the offense. That's not like a random occurrence. And, um, you know, I think for for Justin Herbert, like he doesn't have to throw 35 times in this game to pay off at 5,600, but I think he will. I think that um, Atlanta will at least test this Chargers defense, uh, at, at least in a way that they've been tested in recent weeks coming off a bye. So, uh yeah, I, I don't even have an also viable. It's Justin Herbert all the way. No, I mean, Anthony Anthony Richardson would be the other guy that I'm looking at. But, like, I mean, he played so much better than the result last week. He actually, like, he had a wide open touchdown that was dropped, perfectly thrown. He had, like, four or five plays where there were 20, 30-yard gains that were either dropped or a penalty. They just had some brutal penalties last week that called back some critical – or stopped critical drives. So I, I'm not looking at his overall stat line and like saying, Hey, I, I'm not impressed. I, I actually was like from a pure passing perspective, <clears throat> being locked in uh, way too locked in on that game. Um, I was actually quite impressed by Richardson last week. I have, I have a fun one, but we'll save it for GPPs. Um, let's go to our running backs for cash. And Phil, what are you looking at for your running backs and cash lineups? Yeah, so there's there's one name that jumps off the screen as like an auto click, and that is Chase Brown at 6,200. He's just badly mispriced. Uh, 62 carries, 23 targets across his last three games combined, uh, playing at home in an offense that's sco- uh, implied to score at over 25 points. Pittsburgh matchup is not especially scary for running backs. Over the last five weeks, the Steelers have allowed – about 23% more fantasy points than league average to opposing running backs. Um, After Chase Brown is where it gets interesting because I really like the wide receivers on this slate, although there's also some really great looking running backs, as I alluded to in the open. But overall, I, I think right now I trust the wide receivers a little bit more. So I'm looking at Bucky Irving at 5,800. It's hard to trust a timeshare running back in, in a cash game setting. Not a timeshare anymore, boys. It, we're, we're there, right? last week. I, I feel safe penciling in. Not a time share. John Tucker gets goal line carries now, not a timeshare. Yeah. Well, who knows if he still will after last week, but I, I feel safe penciling in Irving for 15 to 17 touches. And it's against the Panthers. I mean, this Panthers defense needs no introduction at this point. It's week, what, 13. Um, They've allowed the most fantasy points to running backs this season. Uh, I know that Kareem Hunt disappointed us last week, but that guy is a slug. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco can't come back soon enough. But before Hunt, uh, Alvin Kamara ran for 155 on Carolina. Tyrone Tracy cleared 100 yards on 18 carries, so there's really no reason to think they've improved. And as Devin alluded to, um, Irving flipped Rashad White in snap share for the first time last week. And very surprisingly, uh, ran nine more routes than Rashad White did, which resulted in a six for 64 receiving line. I mean, if that's going to continue, uh, Irving is pretty much another lock button at 5,800. So um, I do have some other guys that I think are viable, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you and see if, um, if there's a different way that you're going with maybe Irving or Chase Brown. No, I mean, this is telling me that there's no value in playing cash this week because – I will tell you that Bucky Irving is a lock for me. I, I, I you know, we, we talked about him last week and, and basically said like Rashad White is terrible. He, he's just awful. And if this team wants to go anywhere, um, it has to be through the, the legs of Bucky Irving. I mean, in a prime matchup, Irving dominated and Rashad White averaged like 3.2 yards per carry. I, I don't see how you can then like go back like every week that that continues to happen, Irving will get more and more and more work until it doesn't happen anymore. So I, I don't see, unless it's just his body can't handle it, but 
I don't think he's reached that ceiling yet that prevents him from having a, a massive game. So certainly as a pass catcher, I mean, the only thing holding him, black, holding him back has been his pass blocking. And if he's running more routes, that means he's out on more snaps for passes, which means they're starting to trust him more for from a pass blocking perspective. So like the sky's the limit the rest of the season for Bucky Irving. Um, watch him have like 10% of the snaps this week just because I <laughs> jinxed him. But yeah, he's the he's the clear number. I would have him higher than Chase Brown. Um, I do like Chase Brown, but I would have Irving one and in Brown two just because the matchup. I did have Pittsburgh rated in our rushing and passing matchups this week as a good matchup um, for the first time all season, uh, sort of alluding to that struggle that you've been talking a little bit about. Um, the other running back that I have on my list is Alvin Kamara at seventy seven hundred. I mean, we saw what. I mean, the game plan here is pretty simple. We saw what Saquon Barkley did um, last week against this Rams defense and at 7,700, Kamara coming off a bye. Um, should be in a great spot this week. We have a little bit of Monday night value that opened up because uh, Jacob Dobbins, unfortunate injury. Gus Edwards at 4,300. That's not on your guys' radar. It's just too risky without the passing down work or is that more GPP territory? <laughs> You're hoping for a touchdown. And if he that's scores a touchdown, much. he's going to get the value. If he doesn't, you're getting five points. Yep, that's pretty much where I'm at. He catches zero passes. He's looked like Kareem Hunt, the worst version all season. And um, the other thing is that I really want to play Herbert. And as far as quarterback running back combos go, those those guys correlate pretty poorly because Edwards isn't going to catch passes. I mean – what I will agree on is that his his salary makes a lot of things work for a starting running back. So I think he absolutely needs to be mentioned here um, as in consideration. But I'm I'm hoping and remember that uh, this this show records Wednesday. We're going to post on uh, Friday this week, so we don't quite know uh, what's going to shake out the rest of the week with practice. Um, there, there's two guys on injury watch that I might look to flex uh, next to Irving and Brown. Um, one of them, we heard that Brees Hall missed practice today, and there there might have been an o- ominous sign. Uh, the Jets signed Bam Knight uh, back to their practice squad. So if, if that plays out and we've got $5,000 Braylon Allen, I think he is pretty much a lock button against Seattle. Um, that that defense has improved against the run as of late, but um, they're, they're still a defense that we targeted for most of the season. And man, have I just been waiting to play Braylon Allen by himself in that backfield all season long. So at 5K, that would feel really good. And um, yeah, that match was tough. Of- with, they brought in Ernest Jones and at linebacker and he's made a significant difference. Um, so, but I, at 5K, Braylon Allen is still a guy that I would trust especially if yep. you want to spend up at the receiver yep. position, which it sounds like you do. So, Yeah, and, and to your point, uh, Seattle's held James Conner, McCaffrey, and Kyron Williams in check in the last three weeks. Those are good running backs. Yeah, and Jones has been there. Seahawks, yeah, if you look what the Seahawks have faced, it, it's – I mean, it, their defense is really gelling, really coming together. They have faced a very difficult schedule when you kind of – especially the running back position – when you run it back through the year, the the one that James Cook got him for two touchdowns, and then Bijan Robinson got him a little bit, but other than that, I mean, Devin A. Chan, they played them. Did Detroit guys went for three touchdowns in that back and forth game on Monday night, but for the most part, they've held their own in what has been a very difficult running back schedule. I mean, I throw out anything before Jones because they cut Tyrell yeah. Dodson because he was awful, and then they traded away Jerome Baker because he couldn't stop the run. So, like, they knew there was a problem. They've addressed that problem, and it's taken a couple weeks to get together, but they're starting to gel. So, um, but I would still play Braylon Allen like all day at five k. Like I, it's, but Seattle's not the target that they once were early in the season. Yeah, I think that's a great point on Jones there, and that just speaks to looking at changes within teams and and kind of deciding points that where you want to really take the data from. But Phil, who's the other guy you're looking at? Uh, the one other name to watch is Tony Pollard because uh, I think Tajay Spears was back at practice today, but was still in the concussion protocol. Um, if he does miss this weekend, you've got Tony Pollard 
against the Redskins. Uh, Jesus, the Redskins. Where do? Where, <laughs> yeah, it's Don't been, worry. Been the years. Chargers still play in in uh, Los or in in San Diego for me half the time, so I get it. Yeah, that, well, I, I refuse to call them the Commanders. I refuse to call them the Commanders anyway, and I heard they're changing the logo back, so maybe I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, the Washington Football Team is Tony Pollard's opponent this week, and uh, just stylistically, this is the perfect matchup for a running back like Tony Pollard to take advantage of, and if he's alone. In that backfield, without Spears, uh, he's at an 85% share of the workload in games that Spears has missed. Uh, so he would be like a priority flex uh, for me in a cash game lineup, uh, provided Brees Hall plays and Tajay Spears misses. Let's hit wide receivers. And I know that um, – is Trevor Lawrence going to play is a major question. If he does play, that might open up some things at wide receiver a little bit, but because of the value that you're able to reap out of running back and quarterback that we've already talked about, is this where you're making it up and going up in wide receiver, Devin? I'll start with Phil because he's in love with this position. So I'll let him get the guys that he wants and then I'll jump in. All right. So the first one is AJ Brown, uh, Devante Smith, mispractice to start the week. So assuming Smith is out again, I don't see how AJ Brown doesn't finish as a top three wide receiver on this slate against the Ravens. Uh, They just don't have an answer for him. They've allowed more fantasy points to wide receivers than any team this season. Uh, We saw Jamar Chase, who's kind of like a similar caliber receiver to AJ Brown, uh, had his two best games of the season, including like a 54 pointer against the Ravens. Uh, And this is the game environment that we want to target on this slate. If we're to believe Vegas, it's got the highest over under and the way to uh, attack that Baltimore defense is not on the ground with Saquon Barkley. It's through the air with AJ Brown. Uh, Then Puka Nakua at 7,600 has 14, nine and 13 targets in his last three games. Um, He's just clearly the, the chain mover in that offense and the big play threat. Um, Marshawn Lattimore was shipped out for the Saints, and now they don't have a defensive back that can stay with Nakua. We saw Jerry Jerry Judy and Elijah Moore beat up on these guys in Week 11, Drake London and Darnell Mooney in Week 10, Lad McConkey had a ceiling game in Week 8. Um, So I kind of see like 18 points as Nakua's floor in this matchup, 30 points as his ceiling. Um, And and I, I think his floor might actually be higher than a running back like Alvin Kamara, who's getting all these touches um, just because of the the quality of the passing game. I think it's at least a debate. Um, yeah. I mean, his touchdown equity is like much, much lower. He has five red zone targets all year, um, which is a huge you're, concern, but you're right. Like, but he's going, he's going for 25 or more without the touchdowns, you, you know, fair. Um, Fair, but 37 red zone opportunities to five, right? So, like, the floor, I guess you could make that argument because um, if Kamara doesn't score a touchdown, then certainly I would favor Puka to outscore him. But Mm -hmm. there is a pretty big gap there as far as touchdown equity goes. I'll buy that. Um, so I'll save my my less expensive plays to make this all work for after uh, you tell me who you like at the top. Uh, Lad McConkey at 6,100. Okay. I, I mean, I, I just think that they're going to come out and throw the ball 40 plus times because they're going to try and run the ball. And Gus Edwards is going to run into the back of his center about six times, fall forward for seven yards. And um they're going to have to change game plans and Bo Nix throwing for three Oh eight and four touchdowns against a, a defense certainly bodes well for Justin Herbert. Um, I agree with you with Puka. I would probably prefer. Oh, it's tough. I mean, the decision between him and Cooper cup is a difficult one because cup has that touchdown equity that I was mentioning three touchdowns in his last two games, 10 red zone targets compared to five. Um, I hear you. Um, certainly on the, the Puka upside, which probably Puka is a better cash game play and Cooper Cup is a better GPP play. But uh, just because where ownership is going to lie, uh, Puka is about 24% right now and Cup is about 10. So um, I, I would probably go Cup in a GPP and, and Puka in a, in a cash game play. Brian Thomas, certainly an option if 
Trevor Lawrence plays. If Trevor Lawrence doesn't play, then I want no part of anyone on Jacksonville. I mean, he was just good with, with Lawrence. He was showing out as one of the best receivers, young receivers in football, and at 5,500 seems too cheap um, this week. And then, really, that's like it. I don't know that I love A.J. Brown. Um, I'm probably going to go with Ladd, Puka, and then Thomas. Um, just because I'm going to be spending up at, at receiver or r- at running back with, with a Kamara type running back. But um, if you wanted to go down, I mean, there's not a lot of cheap receivers this week is, is kind of the trend, at least on Wednesday. Like the guys that I'm seeing have any value are like Michael Pittman and Noah Brown, who I want no part of. I wouldn't say I want no part of Michael Pittman. I mean, Josh Downs is going to be out. Um, Pittman, certainly a value at $1,600 less than his week one price because he's had a pretty terrible season. Uh, But you mentioned Anthony Richardson looked better as a passer than the numbers showed last week. I 100% agree. And um, with Downs out for most of last week's game, Richardson uh, still did enough to feed Pittman, who had 96 yards on six catches and seven targets. New England has allowed three 100 plus yard wide receivers in their last two games. Um, I, I, you know, if I had my druthers, would I get up to like a Drake London or a Jackson Smith and Jigba or even a Calvin Ridley from there? Yeah. But I don't know that I could make it work necessarily this week. So uh, Pittman actually is a guy that right now I have in my cash game kind of, shell lineup you convinced me six of the 11 catches are from (laughs) i'm just burned by richardson last week and still bitter about it and i there's a healing process and it hasn't hasn't i haven't gone through the 12 steps yet um i'm still on like step four which i don't even know what that is but like i'm sure it's not good um Man, that, that should have been such a bigger game from Richardson. So, yeah, six of his 11 completions were to Pittman. I'm completely fine with that play. All right, let's look at tight ends. And, and Phil, what do you have for tight ends? So I'm not going to have a lot of extra cash for tight ends. So I'm looking at uh, a couple of cheap guys, and they're kind of interchangeable for me depending on, uh, you know, what you elect to do with some of this salary and, um, but I think you're going to end up within a couple hundred bucks. The first one is Zach Ertz at 3,800. Um, I, I think he gets you two X if he doesn't score a touchdown and three X if he does. And um, Jaden Daniels is definitely looking for him in the red zone lately, which is a good thing, uh, especially now that he's not running quite as much at the goal line. And the other one is Hunter Henry at 4,200. Uh, Henry has one game with fewer than six targets in his last six. He's basically the only trustworthy part of the New England passing game. Um, and while Colts Patriots, you know, maybe the the median outcome there is not a high scoring game, but it's also not impossible with these two young quarterbacks who could make some big plays. So for me, it's one of those two guys. And I have one other name that I think is viable, but I'll see if, uh, if you guys are thinking along the same lines first. Henry's my top guy, but Will Disley didn't practice on Wednesday. Mm. And if he doesn't play, there's two guys. I mean, they have two tight ends on this roster. One is a 290 pound uh, tight end that I'm not even going to mention his name because I clicked out of it when I saw he was 290 pounds. They have a 6'4", 226-pound tight end, Stone Smart, at 2,500. If Disley misses, I might take a chance on this guy and just hope that he catches three passes because he can't be that much worse than Will Disley. That would be how I would this, by the way, and that's why you guys stay here, but, like, we're, we're, we're just measuring people's height and weight and just like assuming, hey, he's on an NFL roster, so they don't have a running back. So, like, let's just assume he's going to be good. Jeff probably has, like, a full scouting report on this guy, but, like, 
I don't really care. He went to Old Dominion. He's really never played. Converted really- college wide receiver. He's uh, got good athleticism. He's flashed in some moments. They liked him a lot in camp, but he never kind of got the tight end part of playing tight end quite figured out. Um, but yeah, the the athleticism certainly there. Is Scott Matlock the other guy that they have listed at tight end, I assume, or is he fullback? Uh, it is tight end Tucker Fisk. Okay. Yeah. It, it, is Hayden Hurst just not a thing anymore? He's on IR. He's on oh, IR. he's going on IR. Okay. Yeah. What's the deal with Mark Andrews? Like, I since week five, he's been tight end four in total points. I don't, I don't understand. Like, it's I, I noticed him like ECR rankings last week was like tight end like thirteen, and it was. You know, he goes out and catches the touchdown again, like tight end five or tight end four since week five. He, he's looked like Mark Andrews again. And it's because he had two zeros in early in the season. Everybody's just completely written him off this year. And I think that when you look at that Philadelphia Baltimore game, I want to figure out ways to get into that game a little bit. And I think Andrews is a very, very easy entry point there. Yeah. yeah. Just go ahead. I was going to say that uh, he was the guy that I had listed as also viable. I think he's right there with the other guys that we mentioned. A little bit more volatility there because of just his snaps and his rap participation when Isaiah likely is healthy. But, you know, five out of the last seven games, 15 DraftKings points or more, even with reduced snaps and routes, you you can't really argue with that. So um, I think it's fine. I have he's no just, problems with he's it. just touchdown dependent, which I don't really like to play that way. I mean, two tu- two targets, seven targets, three targets, five targets. Like on a PPR site, I get the results matter, but like I, he's more of a GPP play for me just because I want a guy that's at least getting six plus targets every single week, which Henry is doing. Well, you get Henry six targets and no touchdowns. I, mean, I understand. One, one touchdown. It's a, year, it's a flaw. I get it. I get it. All right. Before we open up the board and hit our GPPs, make sure to check out. We still have a Black Friday sale. It's not even Black Friday yet. And we still have got Black Friday sale going on on footballguys.com. You can check out the merch. We've got sales going on on merches. Black Friday. Check it out. Get your Football Guys subscription for 2025. Take care of that out of the way or ask for that significant other or loved one in your life or that aunt or uncle that doesn't quite know what to get you for Christmas. A Football Guys subscription is a great way to go there. Let's look at GPPs. And I was pretty quiet during cash section because I think I have a lot of GPPs plays that I'm looking at here. But Phil, what are your quarterback GPPs? No, 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 no. Can't do that. You go first. You go first? Hit quarterback. Rattle them off, baby. Bryce Young, 4,700. The last time he ever mentions that he has a lot of guys, by the way. Bryce Young, 4,700. I like that quite a bit. Going up against Tampa, some feelings there from Dave Canales going up against Tampa. Bryce, we we saw him play probably arguably his best game of his career last week against the Chiefs, going for 265, the way that they were able to move down the field. Granted, it was the first time in history the officials maybe didn't help Patrick Mahomes as there was a couple PI pass interference penalties that ended up being pretty big on that final game tying drive before the Chiefs came back and won it. Anthony Richardson has been mentioned. I mean, Derek Carr is kind of feel makes you feel gross, but you look at that uh, Saints and Rams game, and and that's a fifty one hundred entry point into that. I mean, going up this week at quarterback, I I don't know. I mean, you you certainly want to try to figure out ways to get Lamar Jackson and, and Jalen Hurts into lineups because of the potential that is laying out there in that game. But it's really Bryce Young, and and I you guys were so heavy on Justin Herbert, I decided maybe Bryce Young's probably not a cash quarterback. <laughs> Why do we let him talk? Bryce Young no I'm just kidding Um, that's a player plays football (laughs) those those Um, wins per dollar could be pretty high quarterback's ugly this week and it's why we named one like named one cash game play like if you get beyond Herbert you're just hoping for like an upside game. And it's really about who has that upside game. Um, I think Matthew Stafford at 5,800, we talked about Puka. We talked about Cooper cup facing new Orleans 4% rostered. Like that's insane. It, it, 
it's crazy that like Sam Darnold at 5,900, who doesn't, I think he threw for his first 300 game, yard game last week, maybe a second, but Darnold's going to be about 9% and Stafford's at 3%. Like that just doesn't math. Um, so I think Stafford is, is certainly fine. Uh, Russell Wilson, I want no part of, even though he's going to be seven to eight percent. I don't understand it, but I want no part of that. Geno Smith revenge game, no thank you. Even though the, the Jets are spiraling, but the Jets' pass defense has still been okay. Um, first time I'm ever going to mention him, and probably the last Baker Mayfield, sixty six hundred. That's the state of the the quarterback land, boys and girls. The player that I probably hate the most in the NFL is on my uh, is on my list. Um, and then you can like. As of Wednesday night, if all to Jeff's point, because we're at running backs or running backs and receivers that are at the high end, value is going to open up, and, and it certainly always does. But like as of Wednesday, the the percent rostered are all over the place. Like Jalen Hurts is two percent, Lamar Jackson's two percent, Joe Burrow is one percent. Like those are guys that if they stay that low. You sort of just have to consider them because of their upside, especially a player like Hertz or even Jackson because of their rushing touchdown upside. But I think they'll certainly get a little bit more popular than that as the week progresses. Yeah. So a couple things that I want to touch on. Number one, I haven't looked at a uh, percent rostered, uh, projection yet. So this is going to be the first week on this show that I'm flying blind a little bit. Um, so maybe take my tournament calls with a grain of salt here, but uh, I did run a sim or two to, to get an idea of what it might shake out like. Um, so, you know, maybe I have some, some set of guardrails uh, just a note on, on Bryce young. So I nearly did write him down and then I started thinking about it and it was one of those like, what do you win when you win scenarios? So like if Bryce Young goes for 20, which I think is his ceiling, that means that the other quarterbacks on this slate are going to have to have pretty bad games for you to end up with a first place from Bryce Young, even given the points per dollar. Um, You know, so looking at, at some of these quarterbacks in the mid range, could I picture them? Like really at producing Young, yes. Do I really like Young from a point per dollar standpoint? Also, yes. I think he's going to continue his run of quality games. You know, I think it might just be like 250 yards and two touchdowns, and you're like, oh, Bryce Young is still doing good, but he's not actually um, winning you a whole lot in tournaments. Uh, That said, I think I remember him winning someone the Millie Maker last year. So who am I to who am I to judge? Um, The guys that I do like. CJ Stroud, 6,400. Uh, maybe he ends up more popular than I think because he's got that green 32 next to his name uh, because of the Jaguars matchup. But I don't think anyone's rushing to play a guy who hasn't topped 20 DraftKings points all season, or at least I hope not. Um, no, and, and maybe. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Right now, he is projected to be 3.1%. All right, so my my gut is in the right spot then with his percent rostered. Um, I think there's some upside here, and I think we kind of saw it play out last week, so maybe it doesn't happen two weeks in a row, but could this be, especially with Trevor Lawrence likely to play one of those late-season AFC South uh, sloppy shootouts that results in a lot of points for both quarterbacks? I mean – we did see it happen last week at home with the Texans against Tennessee. Nico Collins is back to full strength. I think that restores Shroud's upside to some degree. And um, I think that if people are going to play a Texan this week, it's more than likely going to be Joe Mixon uh, because it does project well for the running game with the Texans as a five point favorite. So wouldn't be shocked if this was like a four touchdown Shroud performance. Yeah, my, and, my first read on this week, seeing Stroud going up against Jacksonville and the memory of what the Lions did to the Jaguars a couple weeks ago before that bye, I was there. And then seeing the news on Lawrence coming back, and, and that that kind of makes me feel like Jacksonville might have one more last stand in them. And since we haven't seen Stroud do it yet, 
um, at all this year. That that's pulled me off, I think, a little bit. But I he did throw for three hundred and forty against the Jaguars earlier this season, but that was in Houston. I, I mentioned it last week. Stroud is a much better quarterback at home than he is on the road. Last year, seven point three yards per attempt at, at on the road, eight point four at home, sixty six percent completion at home, sixty two percent on the road. This year, he's trending seven point eight yards per attempt at home, six point six on the road, six touchdowns to four interceptions on the road, eight eight to five at home. So, like, he's a completely different quarterback under in the dome. Jeff and I know from his days at Ohio State, he's sulking on the bench when it's any bit windy or cold. And um, I still like it is like it is in, in like it is in Jacksonville. Could be, might be some per- <laughs> precipitation. I don't know. Last week was weird though. Like if there was the like the Texans kept going three and out, and then their offense was arguing. There was one moment where they went three and out. The offense was arguing with itself on the sidelines, and I think it was like a botched punt or something, uh, like a muff, and they recovered it. And it was like the the special teams guy that recovered it like ran over, and like everybody's like, "Hey, we, we're back in it or whatnot." And then they would go out and kick a field goal, and then it's like they're back to arguing again on the sideline. It's it's so, something strange is going on there in Houston. He hasn't been it's the same the- since P. Diddy got arrested. <laughs> Just saying. Man, we I, was gonna, I, was, I was going to say this is a thin play, and it just got a whole lot thinner if he was at the Diddy <laughs> parties, man. Jeez. Um, uh, do I think there's a greater than 3% chance that he could have his best game of the season here. Let me put it that way. And I'll give you one other name. Uh, Kyler Murray at 6,100. Um, he's the one thing that I got wrong last week that, that really did stand in the way of me taking down multiple tournaments, but, uh, this Minnesota pass defense is struggling. If you take away their games against Mac Jones and Joe Flacco, uh, in recent weeks, like every quarterback they face since week four has overperformed last week. It was Caleb Williams, uh, who went for three forty and two touchdowns. I think this could be a, a game that goes over the 45 point total. Um, it's in a dome. I could see Marvin Harrison having a big impact here. And um, just in terms of the math, Kyler Murray's gone over 4X this salary in 36% of his games this season. And I don't know where his ownership is going to fall. I would probably ballpark it at no greater than 7 or 8%. Um, so I think that, yeah, so that, that, that speaks to it. I think he's a, a great option for tournaments this week. Let's hit some running backs. Devin, what are you looking at running backs, GPP? Yeah. Um, trying to find other people who didn't party with P. Diddy. Um, if Brian Robinson is out, I think Jeremy McNichols is at least interesting. Revenge game a little bit going up against his former team in Tennessee. I mean, he's been a special teams guy throughout his career, but like he has the profile to be a, a number one running back. And Washington was talking a little bit about that um last week that they would be okay if both both running backs missed um i think kyron williams is a nice pivot off of cup and uh cup and puka uh because like we've seen him have these big games he hasn't been great like over the last several weeks but the rams should be able to do whatever they want against new orleans like literally whatever they want how Talked a little bit about it last week. Sometimes you get these teams that just aren't that motivated coming off a bye. Uh, certainly could be a, a scenario where like New Orleans went down to Mexico and, and still have a little bit of the, the party bug in them. Um, Chuba Hubbard looked good last week against the Chiefs, like com- relative to every other running back who's faced the Chiefs because the Chiefs are on pace to have a record-breaking performance in terms of yards allowed to opposing running backs. Um, But, you know, this week taking on Tampa Bay and Tampa Bay has this perception that they're like an elite run stopping unit. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, they're allowing the seventh most fantasy points to opposing running backs this year. So I, I certainly think that if Carolina moves the ball, whether it's Bryce Young or whether it's Chuba Hubbard, this Tampa defense just isn't that good in general. Um, 
Other than that, I mean, if you want to look down, I, I do look, like the Braylon Allen call. I think he could get potentially popular. Saquon Barkley's where it gets interesting because facing like the second or third run best run defense, whether you want to give that to Detroit or you want to give that to Baltimore behind Kansas City. Um, if Roquan Smith is out, that is a big loss for Baltimore. And Baltimore does a really good job of like clogging up the middle because they have um, 340-pound Travis Jones at defensive tackle. However, Philadelphia's run game is really about off-tackle stuff because they have the two best tackles in the NFL with Jordan Mailata and Lane Johnson. So if they can get that off-tackle game going, I think you could see some success from Saquon Barkley. Um because Baltimore's relying on a converted linebacker to be their uh, to be their uh, replace or converted defensive end to be their replacement for Roquan Smith, so um, I think at least, at least he's somewhat interesting because he's going to go overlooked simply because of that matchup. And then Kenneth Walker at seven K, I want to target running backs against the Jets. I don't know why, but. It's been a trend for most of the year for me. Yeah, I'll agree with Walker. You know, the Jets are probably a worse than neutral matchup, meaning running backs are more likely to to get over on them. And I think that uh, Walker will probably get lost in like the, the sea of high profile running backs in that top 7K range where you've got uh, Bijan, you've got Kamara, you've got Mixon. You've got Barkley coming off of a legendary game, uh, even Kyron Williams with the New Orleans matchup. Uh, while I agree he's more of a tournament play, I think he'll he'll probably get over double-digit um, ownership percentage while it's all said and done. Um, so Walker, I think, is a good play. Not only that, but I think that like the Jets are about to join the Giants on quit watch with all of the uh, – the, negativity and turmoil surrounding Aaron Rodgers this week. I mean, I, I just can't imagine they come off the bye like as a cohesive unit that's ready to win a football game. Um, so the the Seahawks could just trounce the Jets, um, and that would lead to a big game for Kenneth Walker. I think I mentioned uh, Tony Pollard for cash if Spears is out. Um, if he's in, I think very few people will play him, and the matchup is still – like premier uh, for a running back like Pollard against Washington, who will still get the majority of the touches. Um, and that's it. I mean, I think you could play those uh, more expensive running backs, you know, the, the B John Robinson's, the Joe Mixon's, the, the Barkley's and the, the Williams uh, maybe, maybe Jonathan Taylor, 6,900. He's sub seven K. I mean, Maybe we're just due for one of those 175 yard, two touchdown Jonathan Taylor games, and he's uh, boomer bust. That's for sure. Yeah, New England's been one of those um, one of those matchups that we target running backs against this year. And if people are going to play Anthony Richardson again, then who knows? Maybe he ends up being leveraged too. But um, yeah, you could go in a lot of different directions this week. Jalen Warren, 5,500. It took us until December, but with I think the expectation between the explosion that Warren has shown relative to the lack of explosion that Najee Harris has shown over the last couple of years has, I think, really started to show up, especially last week. It looked pretty obvious, and that's one that is kind of bottom of the barrel there against the Cincinnati defense that's very gettable. They don't love doing running backs in a timeshare, but at the same time, that he could have a, a pretty sizable day. He looks healthy for the first time this year. Wide receivers. Phil, what are you looking at wide receiver? Uh, first name I've got is George Pickens at 6,800. So we mentioned this, uh, what to me looked like a wonky game script that uh, that Vegas was implying for Steelers Bengals. And um, if Pittsburgh is not going to be working with a lead, they're going to be throwing. So I think this could be an eight to 10 target game for Pickens and, against this Bengals defense that's allowed 58% more fantasy points to wide receivers than league average over the last three weeks. Um, I think it's a good play since he just really doesn't have anyone that could stay with Pickens. Um, same game, Jamar Chase, 8,600. You know, I, I do think that A.J. Brown, Puka Nakua, maybe to a lesser extent, 
Nico Collins uh, are really going to draw the attention of the crowd at wide receiver. So if they separate in terms of ownership, Chase has probably a higher ceiling than any of them. And um, I think he would end up underexposed by the field in this matchup. Same could probably be said of T. Higgins. Um, he was the name I was going to mention. Yeah. Uh, more in each of his last four, he's starting to look really healthy. Yeah, both of them look good to me, especially in a week where Chase Brown figures to be chalk. Um, you know, using these guys as as leverage plays in that game makes a lot of sense for tournament. My only issue, my only issue with Chase is he's going to be a little more popular than you might think. Um, not super popular, but right now he's trending to be – where's Jamar Chase? Uh, about 10%, which isn't too bad, but, like, there's people that just – will play him because of that 265 yard three touchdown performance only being two games ago. Um, yep. So I think that that's still going to be baked into his roster percentage just a little bit. Yeah. And by those people, Devin means me um, pretty much. So uh, the, the only other guys I got here real quick, Marvin Harrison, I mentioned earlier in a stack with Kyler Murray. Um, I don't know what happened last week. Marvin Harrison was one of those plays that was not supposed to be popular, right? And everybody thought they were sneaking him in as a contrarian play, and he ended up like 15% owned in every tournament. Uh, and, and that didn't work out so well. So I don't see people going back to Marvin Harrison. But like I said, he, he could get over on that Minnesota secondary. And um, the other one goes with Devin's quarterback, Mike Evans, 6,700. Again, he's in a price range with a lot of other receivers that are going to draw exposure, and the Bucks are playing the Panthers. Uh, so that that's kind of all I've got to say about Mike Evans. I kind of have a feeling that aren't we due for one of those just classic Mike Evans, like 235, three touchdown games? Like, just, just saying. Well, Joey's Definitely. freaking out because he's not going to hit 1,000 yards unless he has one of those games. So, um <laughs> Marvin Harrison was popular because I mentioned him on this show and I move every line that's ever been out there in existence. Would you like <laughs> to buy my prop package for $99.99? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Great collaboration we got going on here. Um, <laughs> I had to do that because I hate those people so much. Um, Nico Collins at 7,900, I think is going to go overlooked. Um, at 10%-ish rostered, I think he has the upside that a lot of these uh, high-end guys do, and you're getting him at a, at a little bit lower roster percentage. We remember that he was the top, top guy in the NFL over the first several weeks of the season. And the Texans are kind of like on must-win watch. And we talked a little bit about C.J. Stroud. A little bit. I don't think that those two are really correlated all that much. I mean, Stroud has struggled a lot this year, and Collins, when healthy, has still been just fine. Um, Jackson Smith and Jigba, if, if there's a way to beat the uh, Jets, it's probably out of the slot. Um, so I think that he's a guy that I, simply just too good to um, not have a little bit of exposure to. So I think DK Metcalf missed practice on Wednesday. So. I don't. Lo I don't love that to be honest. I know it's going to help him, but he'll get more popular. And I kind of like DK taking the top off the defense a little bit. But um, so does what are we, Smith. Yeah. What are we doing with Nick Westbrook Akina? He's going to score a touchdown every week. I mean, <laughs> like forty three hundred. I needed Six, him to catch one more pass last week for reasons. But, 16, you know. 6, 23, and 13. Sounds like a GPP to me at 4,300. I mean, if you're looking for a big play guy, him and Marquez Valdez-Scantling are certainly the guys that you can find at minimum price that uh, all it takes is one. So, uh, And Valdez-Scantling's price has come up a little bit at 4,500. But these are guys that... No one's going to want to play because they don't get targets until they do get that one target that completely changes things. Um, That's kind of it. I mean, some of the high-end guys 
are, are still in play. Brian Thomas, Lad McConkey, Puka Nakua, but Cooper Cup. But like, I don't know. It, it's not all that pretty of a sight or slate because there's just so many guys on these alternate alternate type slates. I, I really enjoy the idea of Nico Collins and Brian Thomas Jr. trading off, like going back and forth. And I, I think that that's um, one of the could be the potential intriguing thing to come out of this week. Jordan Addison was wide receiver one last week, and we've seen Jordan Addison starting to make some pretty big plays. And he started to stack some of those big plays over the past couple of weeks with some more volume last week. He looks really good. And that's, I mean, maybe that opens things up for Justin Jefferson on the other side. Maybe, I don't know. Or maybe that it's just Addison. And because Jefferson's getting the attention that he's getting, you mentioned Valdez Scantling. You mentioned Westbrook and Kine. If you want to go with the, uh, you know, the, the split last name, the pairing. lottery ticket, David Moore, 3,500 going up against Tampa. We saw 10 targets last week and uh, he's kind of, the coach of the field kind of maybe for the Panthers and um, then a real lottery ticket, Calvin Austin, 3,300. He had one touchdown last week. He could have had two touchdowns had Russell Wilson hit him in stride. He's not an every down player, which is Arthur Smith frustration because he should be the slam dunk wide receiver two for the Steelers in my opinion, but way down at the bottom of the barrel at 3,300. We talk about getting one play to, to get, your points he's cap- certainly capable of doing that and if this game starts to go back and forth a little bit like vegas tends to believe he could get involved there tight ends real quick jeff calvin austin yeah. is the king of i play him on the main slate thinking that he's going to be a great gpp play he completely busts and then the steelers play a prime time game and he's the best showdown play in the entire universe every yeah. single time but Sorry, well, this is on. on 1 p.m., so that means punt <laughs> on Calvin Austin. When the sun is out, he's a vampire <laughs> or a werewolf. A he only he only performs when the moon is at height. I, I wrote in my article that every every week it seems like Calvin Austin will make one play to, to make you sit up and, and say, oh, my God. And then Arthur Smith punishes him and, and makes him watch Van Jefferson instead for several <laughs> series. But all right. Tight ends. What do we got at tight ends for a GPP place? Tell me how you get Taysom Hill in your lineup. Mm, it's too expensive. I thought about it. I really wanted to. Is that, that right? Taysom Marcus Valdez Scantling stack? There you go. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a fade Alvin Kamara stack is what it is. Um, is he cheaper on FanDuel? I doubt it. Uh, I'll talk about uh, TJ Hawkinson while I'm looking this up. But Hawkinson, 16 or more points in two of his last three, 4,400, just too cheap. Um, he's a guy that is going to be popular. He might end up being the most popular tight end. Uh, wow. Taysom Hill is not particularly favorable on FanDuel either. So he's a no-go for me, uh, despite probably being 10% rostered. Um, so Hawkinson, he's going to be the most popular guy, likely. Uh, because he's 4,400 and in a favorable matchup, but I'm not going. I think he's still viable. Uh, if you wanted to look at a tight end, you could look at Mark. I and mean, we talked about Mark Andrews, and I think he's an excellent play. But if you wanted to look down, it's really ugly. I mean, if if Devonte Smith misses, Dallas Goddard at 4,300 is intriguing, but like you're really stretching for these guys like Hunter Henry. I'm just kind of out on for GPPs. I don't think he has the upside that I personally want. Zach Ertz kind of the same thing. Like you're hoping that a for those guys to win, it's the Bryce young effect where you're hoping that a tight end doesn't hit their ceiling. And I, I think at 4,400 Hawkinson has a better ceiling. I think at, at whatever price Mark Andrews is 3,900, he has a better ceiling. So and Goddard at 4,300 certainly has a better ceiling. So those are kind of the three that I'm looking at. Oh, and Stone Smart at 2,500 if Will Disley misses. I've got uh, Evan Ingram at 4,800, assuming Trevor Lawrence is back because we've got no Christian Kirk, no Gabe Davis. Both of those guys are on IR. 
Uh, the targets are definitely going to consolidate around Ingram and Brian Thomas. So for 4,800, you're probably looking at 10 plus targets. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly what he's going to do with those 10 plus targets. And now that I hear myself say it, I don't know, maybe more of a cash game play if you could fit him in. But um, I do think for 4,800, you're going to be hard pressed to find a more heavily targeted pass catcher. Um, so I, I think that that Ingram looks good from that respect anyway. That means that we can do our stacks of the week. Phil, what's your stack of the week? I like Stafford, Nakua, run it back with either Alvin Kamara, MVS, or Taysom Hill. You can throw Chuck a comment there too if you want. Took mine, but I don't really ever go that heavy on a game stack. Um, certainly nothing wrong with it, just different strokes for different folks. Um, I'll go. I'll go Baker Mayfield, Mike Evans, the Joey Wright stack of the week. Let's get let's get Mike Evans to a thousand yards. I'll take the layup. You leave the layup. I'll take Justin Herbert and Lad McConkey. Uh, that stacks leave it laying out there. I think it's a great call. You guys were on that in cash, and and I certainly like that matchup against the Falcons. And you can even run it back. I think B. John Robinson, I think, is maybe slightly a little bit underpriced at seventy three hundred. Uh, the ceiling certainly there for him. And we saw the, the Chargers came in with good run numbers, but then they got gashed last week against Derrick Henry, and maybe some things are falling apart there for the Chargers. But discount plays of the week, Phil. What is your discount play of the week? Yeah, I don't have a great one. Uh, the, the one that I wrote down was Marquez Valdez Scantling at 4,500, even though that price has kind of gotten up there a little bit given the, the player that he is. But I don't trust the Rams defense, even though they've been kind of scrappy. They, they stink at defending downfield receivers. And uh, that is what Marquez Valdez Scantling does is he gets downfield in a hurry and he catches touchdowns. This is a potential shootout. Um, I, I do, as I just said in my favorite stack there, I like the idea of, um, if not in game stacks, you could do little mini correlations where if you're playing either uh, Nakua, Cup, or Kyron Williams, you know, putting MBS in there as the, as the cheap part of your lineup makes a lot of sense to me, at least as of Wednesday evening. What do you got, what do you got Devin? Uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to take Phil's Braylon Allen 5k assuming Brees Hall misses. I got to do it. Discount stack of the week. Bryce young, David Moore, Bucky Irving, just awfulness in the NFC South. And and there we go. That's what we got. It's a good thing. There's two minutes left of this. It's a good thing there's two minutes left of this show because everyone would have exited out of, of after uh, that call. So um, happy! I, I was going to say happy Thanksgiving because we're recording on Wednesday, but you guys will already be stuffed with turkey and sick of it when this show comes out on Friday. Sorry for the delay and sorry we're not covering the Thanksgiving slate this week or this year. Timing just didn't work. So good luck, everybody. Um, we'll see you for week 14.